Happy Sabbath Church. Uh, the hymn writer William Malcolm uh, writes the hymn 295 uh, stanza 2 and uh, thus we sing O oh, the height of Jesus love higher than the heaven above deeper than the deepest sea lasting as eternity love that found me wondrous thought found me when I sought him no. Our loving Father, that wondrous love that sought us, that found us when we sought it not, you sustain the hidden life. That wondrous love, that marvelous grace, has preserved us, has protected us, has shepherded us safely through another week and has brought us into this sanctuary, this place of prayer, a house called by your knee. We pray, dear Lord, that for the next few moments as we turn our attention to your word in this divine hour, may it be our testimony that, Lord, was not our hearts burning within us as you spoke to us and pointed to us those things that concern our salvation is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Church, allow me at the very early stage to bring you greetings from my family, my dear wife, Harriet, and our little boys. Do you receive them? Unfortunately, they were not able to make it because we are nursing an infant but I know they are part of the online audience, and uh, for that reason, I'm sure the on online congregation may just well receive special consideration. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Kali for this opportunity to minister at Fifth Gong Avenue. Uh, it doesn't come as a, rare, as a usual opportunity to minister uh, home ground. I also would like to thank and appreciate my brother, Elder Maxwell, who since I received this call from pastor just about a week ago, has not ceased to remind me when the week was getting busy that, hey, brother, you have an assignment pending. Uh, that is to speak to God's children on Sabbath. Thank you very much, Elder Maxwell, for keeping me reminded of this great assignment. Church and our online congregation following from various parts of the world. We thank God for advancements in technology that are making it possible for this message to ride the airwaves straight into several living rooms and to live beyond its preaching today to several uh, uh, more days, even years. Who would have imagined that such a thing could have happened just a few years ago? It can be done in God's name. And when we consider that angel who gives power to the third angel's message in Revelation 18 says, And I saw another angel lighted up the earth with his glory, saying that Babylon is fallen, additionally mentioning all those things that have constituted the corruption of Babylon. It is my firm persuasion, church, that that power that is added to the message that we are proclaiming as a Seventh-day Adventist people is partly given additional power through riding on technology. Of course, it signifies God's children working under the influence and guidance of his spirit to proclaim the last message that is to prepare a people for the coming of the Lord. But I see in a very special sense that that work will ride significantly on the advancements in technology that God 
has gifted to his children. We take a moment also, as I set the foundations of our message this morning, church, to just appreciate our gathering today in church as a people. We gather in response to God's commandment as Seventh-day Adventists, Exodus 28 to 11, and you know it all too well. Commenting on the Sabbath in that timeless book, Education, Ellen White writes and says that whatever portion of our time God requires or takes, he returns to us ennobled and transfigured with his own glory. Would you say amen? Whether it's the Sabbath hours or whether it's his call to return the tithe, whatever of hours that God calls upon us to return, he also returns it back transfigured and ennobled with his own glory. We thank him for his grace and his goodness and his love that has allowed us to be in church this Sabbath. It is not because we have taken exceptionally good care of ourselves, brothers, that we have made it to this congregation today. It is not because you look left, right, left and right again before crossing the highway. It is because of God's divine purpose for our lives. Again, that timeless book which we hold out as, uh, which is held out by the Library of Congress one of the biggest libraries that our world knows today writes of this book and says that it is the best biography on the life of Jesus. The desire of ages. The author says, from what dangers seen and unseen, we have been guarded through the interposition of holy angels. We shall never know until in light of eternity we see the providences of God. Would you say amen? Then and only then will we be persuaded that the angels from the throne of God above guarded and attended our footsteps from day to day and the whole family in heaven was interested in the welfare and affairs of the family here below, of which it's our privilege to be members. We gather this evening against broad protections as saints, uh, looking at it as uh, citizens who are saints. Citizens, saints are citizens. We gather and we do well, friends, to take a moment to appreciate how and why we gather and under what uh, uh, context we gather on this Sabbath. To speak as saints, as citizens, we gather here because of that very transformative document, friends, that we bequeathed ourselves and our generations in 2010 when we all trooped to the referendum and cast our votes and said, yes, we need to promulgate a new order. And that document begins very beautifully, proclaiming in poetic language as A.G. Uh, Gidhamwigai, who says he played a significant part in drafting the preamble to this constitution, says that we, the people of Kenya, acknowledging the supremacy of the almighty God of all creation. Would you say amen? amen. Proud in our ethnic religious uh, di uh, diversity and determined to live in peace and unity as one indivisible nation. That we recognize that as a people we are of different ethnic and religious backgrounds but in spite of those differences, friends, that document presupposes that we will live in peace and unity as one indivisible nation. It continues to say, because this is profound and important for us as Seventh-day Adventists, because in our eschatology, when we place the conflict, we know that there is something around why we are gathering on this day, and the contest around it continues and says in the Bill of Rights, says at Article 19, that the Bill of Rights is an integral part of Kenya's democratic state and the framework for our social, economic, and cultural policies. Listen with me keenly, friends, because this is extremely crucial and will become more so as we move through time. Continues and says in this uh, important document for us as citizens that the reason why, as a people, we are keen to recognize the fundamental rights and freedoms of individuals is because... We are keen to ensure that there is social justice, that people to preserve the dignity of individuals, you and I, and communities as Seventh-day Adventists, and to realize the potential of all human beings. Friends, 
that is extremely important. And finally, friends, that document uh, then goes out and in extremely bold and innovative statements says that every person who, every person has a right to freedom of conscience, religion, thought, belief, and opinion. As though that is not enough, we pride ourselves and we enjoy these guarantees as it continues to say and to, to state uh, very emphatically that every person has a right, whether individually or in community, as we have gathered this, uh, uh, this Sabbath day, in private, when you go back at home, or in public, as we are doing right now, to manifest any belief, any religion, through worship, teaching, observance, including... This now takes the provision a little higher than even what is found in that document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Our Constitution goes ahead to say, including the observance of a, of a day of worship. Would you say amen? Finally, it says that no person shall be compelled to do any act which is contrary to his religion or belief, and it states also that nobody shall be denied access to any institution, employment, or any facility on account of their religion or belief, save for those limitations that are contemplated under our law. And we know that that's where the rubber meets the road. But friends, that is just to give us context that our gathering today is God-ordained. And we are thankful and grateful that we live under a government that is still keen to protect these rights. And while that abounds, and we hope it abounds, we must take a moment to thank God and to do the work while it is still day. Today is a compound Sabbath, friends. Growing up, we learned about simple leaves and compound leaves. It's a compound Sabbath in the sense that globally, it's the Global Youth Day, which is a very significant calendar in the global church calendar. And today we know that our young people are out there ringing the message, love is a verb, a doing one. And since the Global Youth Day uh, program began in 2013, young people have always stepped out into the community to you know, show acts of love and to do deeds of mercy and invite people into the fold of Christ Jesus. It is a significant program uh, day that has made so much impression in the world as it views the Seventh-day Adventist faith. Of course, under that umbrella, we traveled through all the way from the children's ministry, of which it was also the global children's day, through to ambassadors, to pathfinders, to Adventist youth, to public campus ministry, where it's been my privilege for the last two years or so to lead out in the work. And I'm happy to report that as a department, uh, by your mandate and your commissioning, we are gaining ground and we hope that as a church situated in this great center of learning and knowledge, we will continue to be trailblazers pointing out new ministerial lines for other churches to also join us and expand the work. And I'm particularly impressed by the presence of uh, the students from Stare Boys Center because they remind me of my time when we also turned up at New Life SDA Church in similar fashion. And today I have the privilege of sitting on this end. It does show that the work is doing an incredible job and this is where we must focus our attention. Amen? Because the median age of the continent is 19 years. 19 years is the year when people begin their stay on campus. So any church that is not focusing its attention in that age group, unfortunately, may be losing it in the African context. And if you look at it curiously, the global, in the general conference, the entire youth department, almost 80%, is headed by Africans. The global youth director, the associates, it shows this is where the work is in this young continent. And I pray as a church that we will continue to have a burden and a heart to go out there and ensure that we can complete this marvelous cha uh, chaplaincy uh, loop 
that we have created uh, beginning with the incredible work that we have been doing for so long now in our high school uh, chaplaincy program and we transition it all the way to public campus and bring them to join our youth department and grow on in the ranks of service. Isn't that beautiful? Friends, so when I got the invitation, I approached this Sabbath through the lengths of the Global Youth Day, but we also have a local flavor of the hospital chaplaincy, which forms a very critical pillar of our chaplaincy department. So I have the task of trying to marry uh, uh, this, and I hope by the grace of God that this can be done. However, should I fail, the afternoon is underwritten. Uh, by a very elaborate program on hospital chaplaincy. I welcome you all to this service, friends, and I pray that we will feel at Jesus' feet. I thank you, the choir, for that wonderful rendition of music that prepares our hearts to listen to God's word. Friends, We turn our attention to our message this early afternoon. Going. And our text has been read, uh, read to us ably by my sister Lena from Romans. The chapter is 2 and the verse is 4. Our subject, as you've seen in your posters and for those who are following us online, is Chronicles from Far Country. Can you say that again? Chronicles from Far Country. There is a deliberate omission there which the keen eye of the clerk asked me, uh, 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 Brother Teddy, are you sure you ought to introduce a uh, uh, far country there? I told him, no, 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 it's deliberate. Chronicles from far country is our subject of consideration for the next little while. Sister Lena read to us from the uh, NIV version. You follow in your version as I just read it again in your hearing as we set out on this uh, journey uh, to hear God's word uh, this Sabbath. Says Paul writing to the church in uh, Rome, says in Romans chapter 2, and verses 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long sufferings, and not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? To repentance. Know you not that the goodness of the Lord leads you to repentance? That is the text. But we wish to derive its context from a related passage of scripture that then furnishes our title. Travel with me to the book of Luke, and the chapter is 15. Let us look into it for those who love word plays. Dr. Luke, but before I read Luke, to set a foundation for why we read from the Bible, this you don't have to refer, I will just put it out there uh, as you turn the pages to go to Luke chapter 15 and get your hands on the story of the prodigal son. Paul writes to Tim uh, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and he tells him that uh, from a child, Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Would you say amen? As though that was not enough, Apostle Paul, speaking and crumbling under the weight of inspiration, says that all scripture, how many? All scripture, very important. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That provides us with a solid foundation as a church for us to continue consulting God's word. To just provide further context for why we hold up God's word in a time when there are so many competing voices and theories that define faith and govern religion, in that timeless book, education. Ellen White writes and says of the Bible 
that the Bible is the most ancient and the most comprehensive history that men possess. It came fresh from the fountain of eternal truth. And throughout the divine ages, a divine hand has preserved its purity. Would you say amen? Throughout the ages, a divine hand has preserved the purity of the Bible. It lights up the far distant past where human research in vain seeks to penetrate. In the word of God alone do we behold the power that laid the heavens and that set the foundations of the earth. What a wonderful privilege then is ours to have the record of this word, to make reference to it in different times as we travel. The songwriter says, while we travel this pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. And clouds indeed do overspread the uh, skies of our existence. But in God's word, we find strength and courage for every day. To our text. Luke chapter 15 says and verse 15, uh, uh, from verses 11 and he said a certain man had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father give me the portion of goods that falls to me and he divided unto them his living and not many days after the younger son gathered all together and, uh, and took his journey into Happy Sabbath church into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living as it is set out in the King James Version. I don't know what your rendition says. Friends, we venture into Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. The problem with venturing into a consideration of this text, it is a familiar text. And my mind tells me that sometimes familiarity breeds inattention. But I want to take comfort in the fact that repetition deepens impression. Familiarity breeds in attention. But repetition, I hope today, will deepen impression. Great controversy says of the Bible that it is the great anvil that has worn out many hammers. Many people have fashioned uh, messages from the passages of the Bible, but it remains uh, ever exhaustless. I hope today that it will not be a new message, but hopefully it will come out as fresh. And because this is the Global Youth Day, I want to, encourage, uh, I want to in, indulge children. Watoto, watoto. Watoto, watoto. Thank you. Let me get how many? Three kids. Three. Age, age uh, six, maybe that's the age people begin class one. Right? But these days, you know, these guys are sharp. They even begin at three. But six, the original standard one. Please, quickly. Three. Just for the, no right or wrong answer today. So come confidently. My friend Gami is coming. Uh, Baraka is coming. Uh, fantastic, fantastic. We want to engage with them. Uh, all right, all right, all right. How are you, sir? Thank you. Uh, very well, very well. You guys, the, the future of the nation is safe. Okay. Luke chapter 15 introduces us to the parable of the prodigal son, right? But as I've said, there are many things that we ignore in reading. And we do not exercise our minds because anyway, that story has always been concluded. The elder son is the bad guy who, who refuses to get into the feast. The younger son is the intemperate guy who has the audacity to inherit a living father. But let me indulge these young people. Amen? Okay. How long, uh, Gami, you have heard of the, prodigal of the, the, the parable of the prodigal son? Yes. What name would you give him today? What name would you give the prodigal son? Just a random name. And why, why didn't we get ladies? You know now these are constitutional crises. You are setting me up. Can we get two ladies kindly? What name would you give? What name? Or any, any one of you, what name would you give the prodigal son? What, what name? Oh, you give him John. Prodigal son? John. 
Okay. So, if he was living in, uh, in, uh, in, in our world today, uh, which city do you think his father was staying in? Which city? In the world. In which city do you think his father was staying? Or their home was? Where are the ladies? Where are the girls? Sorry. Yeah, where are the girls? Two girls, kindly. Please, please, please. Oh, you look lovely. Please, please. Anyone can answer the question? What name? There is no wrong answer. Any city in the world that you know? America. He was living in America? That's right. Can somebody give me the name of a city in America? Anybody? Children? Or any child in the congregation who is feeling sufficiently moved by this story? Oh yes, what city in America do you think the prodigal son and his father were living? <laughs> Hello guys. I'm on a timer with my sermon. Which one? Kenya. Oh, Kenya. He was living in Kenya. Okay, so if in Kenya, which city do you think he was living in? Oh yes. Nairobi. Nairobi city, that's right. Okay. Now, the Bible says that you traveled into a far country. A far country. So, if he was living in Nairobi, where do you think he went? Oh, which far country? Mombasa. Mombasa? Is Mombasa really far? But a nice attempt. Which far country? Maybe outside this country. Okay. Colombia. Oh, he went to Colombia. Fantastic. Fantastic. For how long do you think the prodigal son was uh, in Mombasa or Colombia? Because the story doesn't give us. It's silent. For how long do you think the prodigal son stayed in Colombia? Oh, yes, Gami? Two days. Oh, he stayed in two days. <laughs> okay, two days. Any other person? For how long do you think? Yes. Uh, one week. He stayed there one week. Okay. For how long do you think the prodigal son stayed in Colombia? Five days. Five days. Oh, okay. Kids don't like long periods of time. Okay. Uh -huh. Seven days. Oh, seven days. These guys are just in within reasonable time. Okay, 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 okay. Now, the text says, kids, that he, he, his father gave him an inheritance and it was, uh, it, it looks like it was a lot of money. How much do you think this, this was in millions? How much money do you think he went with to Colombia or Mombasa in millions? One billion. One billion. This was a rich guy who went to Mombasa with one billion. Okay. Okay, so he went to Mombasa with one billion, he stayed for seven days, and he came from Nairobi, and blah, blah, blah. He had an elder brother, he had an elder brother who was serving the father, but he was like looking for rewards. Eh? What name would you give his elder brother? Just a random name. Yes, Gami? Peter. Peter, and the other, him he was called? John. Thank you. What do we say to the kids? Watoto, watoto. You can go back and say Watoto, watoto. So, friends, uh, a great Adventist preacher, uh, Henry Wright, says that when we read the Bible, we must read it with a scientific mind and a forensic eye. Amen? And one thing I learned in the preparing for this sermon is that the parables that Christ used, they were not idle stories. They were actually real occurrences. You read Kindly, for instance, in the story of the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, Ellen White notes in the Desire of Ages that those characters were present when that parable was being told. So these are not just idle stories, and that's why I was trying to exercise the imagination of the kids and hopefully the imagination of adults in church today to see and to try and imagine because there are so many things that the Bible is silent on regarding this text. And I think the reason why the Bible is silent is because we are generally lazy readers. If it was to pack up the entire story with all the details, I, the Bible is already neglected enough. If it can be two more volumes... I don't know what will become of Christians. And that is a fact because John 21, 25 says, and many other things Jesus did of which are not written in the Bible. And John says, if they were written, he supposes that even the entire world would not have enough space to store. I don't know whether John was, had contemplated the era of the terabytes and uh, super storages. 
But let's trust the word, even in this era. If all the things that Christ did were written, the, even the whole world would not have enough space to store uh, the content of what works Christ did. So friends, the kids have engaged our minds and i like us to approach this text from a bit of a sanctified imagination. Pastor Andres J. Peralta, who is the Associate Director of uh, uh, the Youth Department at the General Conference, preparing material to guide uh, the Youth Week uh, of Prayer that begins tomorrow and which all of us are spearheaded by youth. You know God does not have old children. So all of us are youthful. Amen? I hope the adults will not just turn and say, hey, the preacher has come. Watch our ongeleshe, kabisa. Please, turn it, uh, uh, tune the messages. Our speaker will be Pastor Colin Soyamo. And those who are not able to make it physically to church, please follow online because it will be streamed. It will be streamed. Now, Pastor Peralta writing and says, I have traveled across a hundred countries. I have spoken to over uh, uh, millions of young people. A common question I try to engage them is, what would an ideal someone be for them? And he says, I get a variety of responses, but the one common thread that I see in their responses from young people on what kind of someone would appeal to them has three, at least these four uh, uh, elements. Says, one, it should be biblical. Number two, it should be illustrative. Amen? should be illustrative. That young people want biblical messages. They want them to be illustrative. They want this, the, the messages to be uh, humorous. Humorous. And finally, they want the messages to be uh, timely. You know, they say averagely between 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, I once went somewhere and when I asked the elders how many, how much how much time do we have? Say it, ah, mubiri, roa wa mungu wa kuongoze. Lakini ya si kuongoze sana. So young people just want uh, timely messages. So that, that is our effort this afternoon, to try and illustrate this story. Friends, we get to it, and we easily gather from the text, a full and contextual reading of this passage that Dr. Luke says. Uh, presents to us in Luke chapter 15. Don't go there, but Luke chapter 1, Dr. Luke begins prefacing his gospel account and he says uh, uh, very profoundly, I just read in your hearing, you don't have to turn your Bibles. Dr. Luke says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed amongst us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. The King James continues and says, It seemed good to me also, having heard perfect, not partial, understanding of all things from the very first to write unto you in order, most excellent Theophilus. So, Luke chronicles the things that happened in Jesus' ministry, in order, amen? And uh, theologians have said that Luke wrote with a, a bias and a focus to the Gentile audience. He, he, he looked to appeal to the Gentile audience to show them that you are also part of this commonwealth of grace and that you have not been forgotten. So, Dr. Luke writes with a bit of detail and observation as is reasonably expected of physicians. We easily gather from a full and contextual reading of this passage that the father was a man of means and large estate, a wealthy man. The text says that he hired many servants, and not only were the servants numerous, they had enough to eat, and not only did they have enough to eat, the text says, do not ignore words, that they had enough to eat, and to do what? To spare. Preach, uh, follow the preacher. Indeed, Proverbs chapter 10 and verses 15 is true when it uh, rings true when it says, the rich man's wealth is a strong city and the destruction of the poor is their poverty, as we shall also see in a little while regarding uh, the young man. Let's for a moment, church, be a bit generous and magnanimous in our understanding of the prodigal son, who sympathetically is always an easy villain. The prodigal son, he was called John by the kids. Allow me to call him Sean. Prodigal Sean. I hope there is no Sean in congregation today. But if there is a Sean in church, it's purely just for illustration. 
So prodigal Sean hated the restraint in his father's house. He probably reasoned that far country, that unnamed country, which the children suggested was Mombasa or Colombia, had better social, economic, even educational advantages. A better investment climate that offered promising returns. That the freedom in far country was more contemporary and would be ideal for a forward-looking and free-thinking young man if he was to compete and remain relevant in a dynamic and fast-changing society. Sounds familiar? Picture with me in your sanctified imagination as prodigal Sean packs his bags. He wound up his domestic affairs. We don't know whether, like good old prophet Elisha in the Old Testament, when he received his master Elijah's call, only now with the reverse intention, whether prodigal Sean invited his friends and threw a big party to mark this significant transition in his life. He said bye to his elder brother. The kids called him Peter. I will call him Big Brother Ben. He said bye to his elder brother, Big Brother Ben, perhaps. We take a moment to wonder what their relationship was like. Now that the Bible does not detour to furnish such details, perhaps for fear of well overwhelming modern day Christians. We don't know what the relationship was like between these two siblings. We don't know why, for instance, there were only two sons. We don't know why, for instance, all of a sudden, if at all, he just breaks out and says, Father, divide unto me a portion of my living. There are certain uh, 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 fundamental questions of family life that can be investigated in this family. We must take a moment to think, what was the family life in this house like? What was the influence of the family board like? What was uh, the upbringing of, of this young man like? Was he the outlier? Was he just the child who, for whom you cannot take an account? You have done all that you can. You have lavished love. You have, you have given good advice. You have taken them to church. But they still surprise you and tell you, give me a portion of my living. Or mom, did you know I have joined that society which only has initials L, G, B, K, and Z all the way. We don't know, but we must examine because the, uh, the, the, the home is the foundation of society and home influences go a great way in determining what kind of society we have. That's why we must support the children's department. Amen? Prodigal son or prodigal Sean bids adios to his favorite servants in his father's household. And in modern day fashion trends, perchance, elderly folk, you can take a commercial break from the sermon, but you may listen in as I onboard the young people. Perhaps in modern day fashion trends, with white sneakers on, the latest trendy Gucci denim, denim uh, pants adorned. A pure white, 100% cotton content, muzzle shirt on his upper frame. Perchance revealing his bulging muscles and toned frame. Add some designer shades and some high-end cologne to scent. You picture the prodigal show? He stood at the front of Big Daddy's sprawling mansion on its well-watered, neatly manicured lawns. He motioned one of the ever so loyal, even timid servants to take one for the ground. Hello, young people. To take one for the gram. Up, the photo went, almost simultaneously, on his social media handles. On Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp status, Snapchat, name it, you know it. A short celebratory dance, even a victory chant, also went up on TikTok. Then came the hashtags. Hashtag, captain of my destiny. Hashtag, doing me. Hashtag, you only live once. Hashtag, prison break. Hashtag, freedom must last. If his departure date was fifth, it would be hashtag, my fifth is fifteen. <laughs> but let's pause there for a moment, church, online and physically present, on hashtags, trends, trolls, tags, posts, and reactions the modern-day lingo of young people. The blessing, or is it, curse of social media for digital natives. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 10 and 6, 
I have seen folly set at great dignity. We take a moment to consider how young people interact with these uh, advancements in technology. Are we using them to point people to Jesus Christ or we are using these platforms to flip-flop in between righteousness and wickedness? At the end of today's evening, Sabbath was nice. A beautiful photo. Tomorrow, a mishmash of signals. Even the world is wondering, where are you? They cannot determine where exactly you stand. What is the influence of these facilities, digital facilities in our possessions? Not just as kids, but even as adults. How many homes are being broken because of that smartphone? Nay, foolish phone. Great Controversy says something profound, and I echo, from page 488. Says that Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds, that we will not dwell upon the subject which we ought to be best acquainted with. The arch deceiver, the who? The arch deceiver. There is a bishop and there is an archbishop. The arch deceiver hates the great truths that bring to view an atoning sacrifice and an all-powerful mediator. So we are warned as Christians living on the age of time that the enemy invents unnumbered schemes. Not one, not two, not a hundred, not a thousand. While I am preaching, I know there is somebody somewhere in the corner of the church who is waiting. When will this be done? When will this be done? A text has come and it flickers as a notification saying, so and so reacted to your message. Unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds. Those who follow politics and consume all that campaign palaver and its subsequent, uh, subsequent declarations like fish. Following, following. Others are on trends. What is trending? And has become consultants to the world. Fast and furious, the reactions came on the post that prodigal Sean put up. Likes, loves, and as they say, comments fupi, fupi fupi. You know, for this generation, mambo ni mengi, masa ni machachi. Whatever you want to tell us, make it short and snappy, or else stay with it. A friend he had previously connected with in far country quipped, I know we have audiences all the way from uh, the islands of uh, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, but a far country friend quipped and said, Bazu, ukefika base, the boys will be waiting. Translated, big man, when you land, the boys will be there waiting. Similarly, a conniving, far-sighted, rather bold and well-known slay queen chimed in. Safe travels, dear. Ukefika, just holler. I got a plug. Translated, travel well, travel safely. When you land, just give me a shout. I got something interesting we can do. On our end, the Slay Queen's end, comes the notification. Prodigal Sean reacted to your comment with five heart emojis. Ah, she smiles back to herself, uh, rather uh, 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 slyly, and begins arranging her clothes. Ellen White says, concerning the clothes of probation, a day now not too distant for those that consider the prophetic landmarks as we do. It is while the man of business will be chasing paper, making deep laid strategies on how to win that lucrative tender and make the next big, big buck. It is while the daughter of fashion will be arranging her adornments that that final irrevocable tense, uh, sentence will be, uh, pronouncement will be made. It is done. When men are occupied with the fleeting and passing affairs of life to the utter exclusion of God and his redeeming love. Follow with me, friends and church, the progress of the prodigal son, now called prodigal Sean. When he turned up in far country, the sights and sounds of the new environment are all too alluring. He has an initial resolve, like many of us, to try and live to the high ideals that had been imparted by Big Daddy's household. But this is quickly overborne by the steady current of evil that tag at the answering chords in his heart. His resolutions to try and steady the ship and perhaps prove naysayers wrong, back at home wrong, 
are like ropes of sand. Evil associates suggest plan after plan, plot after plot, and soon he gives up any attempt on the high and narrow road. Down begins the steep and steady descent. Commenting on Samson, the story of Samson, Petrix and Prophet says that the onset of sin is not sudden and startling. It is the gradual undermining of the strongholds of principle. We must be a bit generous with prodigal Sean. Perhaps he left home with certain high ideals to go and prove himself. But the strong tide of evil overborne him. He plunges himself into the life of party and, uh, partying and girls. Soon, prodigal Sean finds himself in the red light district in far country city. The baby, if you may allow me, of bootylicious beauties beckoned with a deep pocket and a seemingly inexhaustible reserve. Prodigal son sent fair, sponsored lifestyle, provided form. He was simply the guy, that guy. He went above, way above the state prescribed ceiling of 3,000 shillings for salon and hair. It was party after party after party after party for prodigal Sean. Prodigal Sean lived like Esau of old, boisterous, loud, adventurous, impatient of restraint, focused on the present and banishing away like a bad and unwelcome dream any thoughts of eternal realities. He was the life of the party. Alcohol flowed at his back and call. His pleasure-loving companions listened to his word and held him in utmost regard. Friends, they jammed to the latest hits on the flickering neon lights of far country city clubs and had one blast over time. Sin appeared less and less sinful and righteousness less and less desirable. In no time, Prodigal Sean was making headlines in the entertainment scene in far country city. Fashion, entertainment, and lifestyle scribes in far country fell over themselves to get a scoop from this new, even foreign kid on the block. Silver-tongued, sharply dressed, investment and finance honchos presented glittering proposals. Get rich quick, pyramid schemes. They promised quick and sure returns to prodigal Sean. Not wanting to work, but keen to ensure a continued lifestyle of ease and pleasure, prodigal Sean thought to himself that these grand plans, rolling off easily on the tongues of these studied conmen, were indeed grand and genius plans. Alas, he signed off the big check and thus culminated the steading away of his prematurely inherited fortune, as the text says. Follow with me, the text move and, moves and so must the preacher. The plot thickened fast. He was soon threatened with multiple lawsuits in foreign land. Auctioneers were upon his tracks. He had to change his neighborhoods and downgrade to, uh, uh, to match his fast-changing fortune. Even at his last address, Landlords issued notice, distrained for rent, and eventually kicked him out. And as Murphy's law would have it, everything that could go wrong got going wrong for prodigal Sean. His visa expired in Colombia, and son now had to leave uh, dodging the authorities. He had no work permit, and even if he did, he had no corresponding papers to demonstrate qualification in foreign land. In vain, prodigal Sean, as we would all do, reached out to his companions who had eaten and drunk at his expense in his sunnier days. But they avoided him like a plague. In particular, his insurance and investment friends, sitting at their favorite joint, call it a watering hole if you like, sipping away hard stuff and billowing smoke like chimneys, now self-righteously quipped and punctuated it with an evil laugh. We told him to take out a good cover. But he could not hear us. That health challenge would have not been so bad. We told him that you can never... We, I begged him, Subs chimes in, I begged him to invest in T-bills, but he could not listen. You can never go wrong with T-bills. Dev said, I took him out severally to check out prime parcels with ready titles, boreholes, electricity, Paved roads in a gated community, 
somewhere in a fast rising area, a little area of far country city. But I thought I was only interested in swindling him. Serves him right. Friends, prodigal Sean now finds himself having to join himself to a citizen of this foreign country who sends him into his pigsty to take care of pigs. His has been a fall from gra uh, grace to grass. And now seated in that lonely pigsty, I picture him penning up a, a letter to his father as part of his contemplation to get back home to Big Daddy, 14th Street, Golden Streets, from your dear son, the younger. Dear Dad, I can't believe it has come to this. As I write this letter, Dad, warm tears are welling in my eyes. I cannot imagine that from the five course meals regularly served in your table, I have to scrounge for a meal with pigs. Even my masters find it hard to make that offer of pig meal. Daddy, it's gotten this bad. I wish I had told you at the first instance, but I was all too consumed in my fast and pleasure-loving life, Daddy. But I escaped a broken jaw in that bar brawl. That slave queen nearly infected me with a disease that would have been terminal. Daddy, I have been hounded from prison to prison. But luckily, my friends, when they still thought I could uh, rescue myself, came to my aid. Daddy, mine has been a fast downward fall. I have moved from elegant addresses, and now I find myself in the pig star. Daddy, I recall how you treat your servants, how so progressive you are. Your employment practice baffles me when I contrast it to what I see from my masters in the pig star. At least at home, the servants have enough to eat and even to spare. Here, my pigsty master has changed my salary ten times like they changed Jacob's salary, at least as you taught us, in the family board. Daddy, it is not well with me, but I am all too ashamed. He can't not get himself to finish this letter, and he throws it away. He says this is becoming all too cumbersome. I will make it short. I will rise and go to daddy. The text says, when he came to himself. When he came to himself. Luke chapter 15, we just go back to our text as I get uh, uh, on the home stretch of this message. Says, and when he came to himself, verse 17, said, how many of my hard servants of my father's house have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father. When he came to himself, friends, the protracted wooing of the spirit, the grace from the throne of God that goes forth to meet the grace already working in the sinner's heart. Grace positioning system had already located him. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The text is silent, friends, on how long this was, how long it took for him to come to his mind. We do not know, friends, whether there were any zealous, I will go missionaries who reached out to desperate prodigal Sean, or any missionary tracts published like leaves of autumn by indefatigable, self sacrificing literature evangelists. We do not know whether the Adventist world radio broadcast that brought good news of salvation riding the air, airwaves straight to him caught up with prodigal Sean. But this afternoon, friends, as we reflect on this chaplaincy Sabbath, we remind ourselves that there are many like prodigal Sean who now rely on our chaplaincy ministries to reach out and to locate them. Would you say amen? 
We contrast the story of the prodigal son with the experience of Joseph. Joseph proving himself true and steadfast to principle when taken as a slave in, in Egypt and put in Potiphar's household. Joseph holds himself out as true and steady to principle and says, how can I do such a great sin, uh, uh, such a, a wicked thing and sin against my God? We contrast prodigal shown in a far country with the story of Daniel and the three uh, the, his friends standing up against King Nebuchadnezzar saying, know ye king that we will not bow to this golden image nor worship your gods. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning and fiery furnace. Standing out true and steadfast to principle in far country in contrast to the story of prodigal Sean. But we parallel the story and experience of prodigal Sean with Samson, betraying his strength to foreigners, and now finds himself eyeless in Gaza. And now, as the Spirit of God speaks in his heart, gets his hands on those two pillars, and beseeches heaven, saying, Strengthen me this once more. And the number of people that Samson killed in his last day were more than those that he ever killed in his ministry. Chronicles from far country. Ambassadors in foreign lands. To our ambassadors, the call still goes forth that we must stand up and stand out true to duty. That we must be as a light set out in our community. That we must be that hope that presents to the society. Pathfinders, like the prodigal son, finding his way back home, we must lead many more people to Christ Jesus. His grace is still holding out the wonderful call. Sinner and wanderer, come back home. And God gives us this great opportunity to collaborate with him. Says in messages to young people, with such a great army, as our youth rightly trained, how soon would the message of a crucified, risen, soon returning Savior be carried out to the entire world? How soon would we finish the work of giving out the life-saving gospel message to the world in our generation? To the youth and to the young professional, the message goes out that we still have a work to do in reaching out to prodigal shones in our midst. Today, friends, on this Global Youth Day, on this Chaplaincy Sabbath, I do well to remind us that there is still hope for those who, like the prodigal son, have lost their way. The love of God still holds out, and that love, Ellen White notes, is of quick sight. Like the father beheld the son returning from afar, God beholds us from far. We make the first step, and he reciprocates and meets us even before we have made the majority distance. There is hope for such an one who this day finds himself in far country, away from family and away from God. How it's my prayer, dear friends, that we, like the prodigal son, may reflect upon God's goodness that leads us to repentance. That we, like the prodigal son, may rise up and say, I will return to my father's house. That those of us who have since disappeared from God's service, either betrayed or who find that the standards within church are way too low or that the number of hypocrites within is just amazing, I pray that we will find our way back to our father's home. That grace is sufficient and that grace abounds. But more importantly, friends, as I conclude, this message pre presents us with the hope of yet another far country. The songwriter says, we speak of the rims of the blessed. That country so, far, so bright and so fair. But what must it be to be there? John writing in the Revelation says, and I, John, saw the new city, Jerusalem, descending out of God from heaven as a bride at 
And I heard a great voice saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God himself shall dwell with them and shall be their God. And continues to say of far country, There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no more crying or pain, for the former things will have passed away. I look forward to join that far country. I look forward to making a clean break from this far country. May God bless us in Jesus' name. Our song reminds us that it's never too late to get back home. Amen. We may not have been in the same exact position as the prodigal son, but in different ways, we could have drifted away from God's path for us. We may have gone away from his sight or from his service. We have neglected the work which we ought to do. But this afternoon presents us with an opportunity to get back home. Driven by God's love, unfailing, much less. The hymn writer said, Oh, the height of Jesus' love, higher than the heaven above, deeper than the deepest sea, lasting as eternity. Love that found me, wondrous thought, found me when I sought him. Not. I want to commend us to God's grace and his keeping. That those of us who find themselves astray give you the assurance that that grace positioning system has already located you. That God made the first advance to reach out to us. Amen. Jacob in a moment of extremity when he did not know his standing with God he falls into sleep and he beholds that wonderful ladder. And the Bible says that angels of God were moving up and down on that ladder. And God presented or restated his promise saying, I'm the Lord, your God, the God of Abraham, your father, and Isaac. A faithful and covenant-keeping God. I want to give us the great assurance and promise that he who is faithful has made the first step. And we sure can get back home. As I make this prayer, I don't know if there may be such an one. You can just raise up your hand so that I make, I, I make this prayer to commend you to heaven's keeping and care. Is there anyone? Just raise your hand that heaven may take a special note of you this afternoon as I make this concluding prayer that we all can return back home. Shall we pray? Our loving Father in Jesus' name, it's a wonderful privilege for us to be in your presence. We have reflected upon the passage of scripture. And we see the marvelous work of your grace. Tracing us, dear Father. Wooing us, reaching out to us. In our extremity, dear Father. In our fallen condition, dear God. At the point of despair. Yet you still call us. That Father, we can press on the homeward way. In response to a declaration of this word after, this afternoon. Your sons and daughters are holding up their hands. Saying that may heaven take a special note of them that they desire to get back home, dear God. They reflect on their chronicles in far country, that country, dear God, where the arch deceiver only steeps us in sin, and they desire that, Lord, that light that shines from the harbor may lead them back home. I pray, dear Father, that you who is a faithful God, who has never lost a battle, dear Father, I pray that you may take care of their needs. I pray that you may meet them, dear Father, and that you may strengthen, strengthen them, O oh God, to keep on the upward way. Be with us, dear Father, even on this Sabbath as we continue seeking your face, God, and as we continue exhorting one another to love and to good works. May your blessings be ours is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.